Hello and thank you everyone for joining us. For those of you that don't know me, my name is Christy House and I am the Manager of Welfare and Industry at Equestrian Canada. Um, so the purpose of today's webinar is to take an opportunity to engage the community and do some knowledge sharing on the ongoing uh, national advocacy efforts that Equestrian Canada and our external stakeholders have been working on um, in response to the COVID-19 pandemic and the impact to the sector. Um, <clears throat> so we first uh, started our efforts in early March. Uh, one of the first steps we took was a as releasing a survey to try to get a better grasp on the impacts to the businesses. And I'm, Bronwyn, I'm sure will speak a little bit more to the findings of that survey. Um, but we know that the impacts of uh, COVID-19 on equine businesses in Canada has been catastrophic. And the uniqueness of our operations has left a uh, very large expense gaps that are not currently covered by um, COVID-19 relief programs. Before we get started, I want to take the time to thank all of the equine industry members that have maintained such professionalism, integrity, and social responsibility during these trying and stressful times. All the contributions from completing survey data and contributing to guideline development and providing ongoing information about what your business needs are and your animal needs are during this time has been instrumental in developing our um, the information that we're providing to the federal government and the evidence that we've used to help inform this ask. Um, Equestrian Canada has received very positive feedback about the detail, the timeliness, and the clear indicators of relief needs within our ask from many different levels of government, including MPs and ministers. And we, <laughs> we have everyone who has positively contributed to this to thank for that. Um, this community has showed amazing amounts of strength and collaboration throughout the pandemic, and it's time we put that passion to work for our industry. Um, we need to continue to push for relief. We need, uh, and most importantly, we deserve it. If you're not personally affected, one of your fellow horse people are. Um, one of the barns that helped shape you as a horse person is, and we are all in this together. We're stronger together. So today we are getting everybody together and providing further resources that will help all of us better understand what's being asked, that will help inform your conversations with your local MPPs and MPs, as well as some tips and tricks on being a good advocate in a time that is already, um, the government is receiving a large volume of requests based on the number of industries that have been impacted at one time. So today we have, um, our first speaker will be Bronwyn Wilton. She'll be giving a detailed look into the report that really has been the backbone of our ask to the federal government. Um, afterwards, Peter Seaman from Grassroots Public Affairs will spend some time helping us navigate how to be an effective advocate. Uh, before we get started, I just want to say I'm very thankful for the contributions that both Bronwyn and Peter have brought to the advocacy campaign. We have definitely been able to divide and conquer and all of our strengths pulled together as well as Bronwyn staff and Peter's staff and all of the stakeholders and committee members that have contributed have really made um, us shine through and we've heard this feedback that we really do have a detailed ask and we were locked and ready to go with the evidence that the government needs to do something tangible. Now we've heard all these things but we really need to see some results now. Um, with the launch of the public campaign this week we're hoping to get the community more engaged and help you use your voice to continue to put the pressure we need to see some results. So I will now introduce Bronwyn Wilton. And I will try to be brief because she does have a very long resume, um, but she holds a PhD in rural studies at, and a master's of science in rural planning and landscape architecture into, in addition to a bachelor of science in agriculture. Um, Bronwyn brings creative energy to solving complex problems <laughs> and draws upon her experience in interdisciplinary research by taking systems thinking approach to developing solutions for the client needs. And this skill of Bronwyn's has really been an asset in the ongoing issues that uh, both the Equine Industry Development Committee and the Equine Industry have been working on around having the equine sector more recognized within the agriculture sector. So we really pulled on Bronwyn's skills to help us collaborate and really find the type of information that we needed to move ahead with that. Um, a little bit, a quick little bit about Wilton Consulting Group. Uh, they bring years of experience in qualitative and interdisciplinary research message that can be applied to the wide range of situations in different sectors and focused on solution-based outcomes. So with that, I'll hand it over to you, Bronwyn. Great. Thank you, Christine. Thank you for the introduction and really pleased to be here today and uh, share what we've been working on. Um, we're kind of behind the scenes working to support Equestrian Canada and all of Christie's efforts uh, 
in moving this forward with the federal government. So this morning, I just wanted to share a little bit about um, what we've been doing and where some of the sticky points were in terms of creating that conversation with the federal government. And uh, I want to go over a little bit on the definition of equines in Canada, which might sound very obvious to all of us who love horses and know horses, but it's not always so clear in re regulations and legislation. Also, also want to talk about more specifically the survey results and the COVID-19 impacts that Christy mentioned. And then more broadly, some recommendations, not only for the COVID situation, but moving forward as a sector post COVID or as this kind of new normal continues. All right, so for the definition of equines in Canada and for people who love uh, combing through legislation, this is a good exercise if you ever wanna figure this out and provide support on this. But uh, one of the reasons this is so important is because if you're going to uh, ask for some type of emergency relief for an industry or a sector, you need to know where it fits and which department is responsible for that industry or um, issue you're asking for relief for. So what comes up is that horses uh, fall into a little bit of a gray area where some people say, well, they're not really livestock and they're not really pets and they're not really athletes. They're kind of a whole mix of a number of things. So what we looked to do first when we first started working with Christy was to find all the definitions where they do actually get noted as being livestock under federal legislation. So here's a few examples here, the Feeds Act of 1985, livestock means horses, cattle, sheep, etc. And for the purpose of, of this act and the Health of Animals Act includes livestock, meaning animals of the bovine, equine, capering, ovine and porcine species and animal de ferme is the French term for the livestock animals. And then the Income Tax Act also includes the tillage of soil, livestock raising or exhibiting, maintaining of horses for racing. And this last one is, a little, is an example of where we get into a, a problematic situation where horses start to be defined for what they actually do. So racing is a very specific activity that's a very important one for the horse industry, of course, um, but it leaves out all the other things that we know horses do that provide economic income for various businesses across the country. Oops. So those are um, a couple more definitions in the Canada Revenue Agency. So the CRA includes the raising or exhibiting of livestock within its definition of farming. So that's a positive thing. So raising horses is counted in there. However, uh, livestock is not clearly defined other than it should be interpreted consistently with the equivalent term, the farm animals or animal de ferme, as we noted earlier in the act, and livestock or domestic animals bred or kept on a farm for use and commercial profit. So in a case of beef cattle, that's very clear. You keep a number of beef cattle, you sell them to the market, you have a commercial profit from those beef animals. Whereas providing lessons or therapeutic programs or those types of uh, wide variety of activities that horses uh, participate in, it's not quite as clear whether that use is a commercial profit. It might be clear to us if in the horse world and people who are actively engaged in horse things like say, of course it's clear, but um, when you look at the actual legislation and when you start to try to tap into different programs and uh, business risk management programs, those types of things, it has to be clearly defined in the legislation couple of examples from across the provinces, and this varies, and I'm sure Christy can answer some specific questions on provinces across the country, um, but just some examples for this morning. In Ontario, the Assessment Act of 1990 uh, concluded that farmland includes land if used for breeding, raising, boarding, maintaining, training, or selling horses, or if it is used to provide horse trail rides or horse riding lessons on the same parcel of land as other lands or buildings whose value has been determined. So that's a really positive thing in terms of looking at it from a farmland and a land use perspective, that those types of activities are considered agricultural in Ontario. And then we see a, a different kind of spin on that from British Columbia, income from boarding, training, rental, showing or racing alone are not qualifying income for farm class purposes. But if operated in conjunction with horse stud services as part of a rearing operation, they may qualify. So again, we're getting into these uh, splitting kind of the definition based on what the horses actually do. Uh, so usually breeding or racing falls a little more tidily into definitions, whereas other activities that are perfectly 
acceptable economic and commercial types of activities for small businesses and in, in particular in rural communities may fall into a gray area where they don't count as actual farm income. And so why do these definitions matter? As I've mentioned before, um, a lot of agriculture and agri-food business support and business risk management programs are targeted at what's often termed bona fide farms and farm businesses that can demonstrate a certain amount of income from farming activities. And usually across the country, there's different definitions, but to get your farm business registration number, which is usually your kind of pass into a whole wide range of programs, the farm income piece becomes really important and sometimes there's a financial cutoff. So again, going back to the example of beef cattle, if you raise a certain number of beef cattle and sell them the market for a year, you're likely going to make that cutoff as a bona fide firm. And then that's very clear where you fit into applying for different programs and um, you know, business support programs and other benefits. And this goes beyond COVID. So there's uh, examples of programs that may benefit equine farms in the broader community, which have traditionally not always been accessible to horse farm owners. And COVID has just put a really fine light, a spotlight on that problem in terms of saying that, um, I don't know, I see a Q&A question. Do you want to answer questions during that, Christy, or? Uh, I'm, just, um, I'm just tracking them and we can get to them at the end. Okay, perfect. Great, and uh, so then I just, going back to this though, so there's examples from environmental improvements. So if you're in a watershed and wanna participate in a tree planting program, sometimes you can, and sometimes that farm business registration number might have prevented you from uh, participating. So, so this goes especially important during COVID, but it's also something to, for the industry to think about moving forward and why it's important to kind of figure out where the horses fit in Canadian agriculture and rural economies. And we also know that horses perform multiple roles on farms and businesses and communities. And these roles are often not recognized as conventional farm income. So when we started working with Christy in Equestrian Canada early on, we started talking about, well, the definition is important. So we have to kind of fine tune what the definition should look like and what would make sense for the industry as a whole. And I know Equestrian Canada was working on this uh, in conjunction with some provincial sport organizations prior to COVID. This was something that was known as an issue of this kind of gray area where horses fit in definitions. Uh, but it became really apparent and really urgent uh, with the COVID situation. So we worked on some various wording and this is draft, for example, right now, but it is, does give them a working de Equestrian Canada definition, working definition um, to move forward in terms of the communication with various levels of government. So we looked at it in terms of active equines. So active being a term that uh, denotes that they're doing something. <laughs> so there's horses that work on trail rides, some lessons, therapeutic programs, some very different types of programs in terms of team leadership building even, or, or the sport, recreation, uh, and all those other things that were, are more traditional ones. And they're making direct economic contributions to revenue generating activities. So for example, you have 10 horses on your farm, two might be retired, they're no longer contributing to revenue generating activities, but eight of them are actively providing revenue generating activities. You can't make your income without the employment of those horses. Um, so that's an example there. And then they may be used for pedigree development, sport, competition, youth or adult development and wellness, physical exercise, therapeutic use, or agritourism. So trying to leave a very broad range of definitions of what the, these horses are doing on these farm businesses. And that gets to the actual facility itself. So terming it active equine facilities, being a commercial agricultural business using farmland, purpose-built structures, and active equines to generate revenue. These facilities may offer a mix of services, including breeding, raising, training, boarding, and maintaining health and welfare of active equines. And just to put a clear boundary on that, the active equines and active equine facilities do not include operations or animals used in food processing or pharmaceutical industries. So this gets us, kind of sets the stage for that trickiness of where horses actually fit um, and trying to put a clear um, focus on how they actually are an income generating part of rural economies. 
and getting down to the impacts from COVID. Uh, so in April, well, late March, early April, Question Canada did survey members online about COVID-19's impact on operations. And this is necessary uh, for a few reasons, partly because when you're going to ask for support, you definitely need to know what the impact is and having um, some real and authentic current numbers is very helpful. Uh, we analyzed these results using, and we also cross-referenced the results from the survey because it was kind of short, it was only online for a short period of time. Um, they had a good number of responses, but of course you wanna kind of cross-reference that with what is known about the industry separately. So we cross-referenced with the Census of Agriculture data. The most recent census was 2016, which was not too bad. And also some data from provincial sport organizations and um, some insurance companies helped out a little bit with some, some insights into what they know about the numbers from their work. And the goal of this data analysis was to estimate the number of acti active equine facilities, active equines, and the financial cost of the pandemic to the industry. Oops, keep hitting the wrong one. So before I <laughs> get into that tole, I just wanna put another little layer of context in the, with horses and the challenge with counting horses in Canada. Um, and you would think we would absolutely know how many horses live in Canada for various reasons, for economic impact purposes, disease surveillance, those types of things. But unfortunately, um, given the definition challenges that I went through earlier, this also impacts how the Census of Agriculture is able to count horses in Canada. So we know from 2016 that there are just over 290,000 horses in Canada counted in the census and number of farms with equines. So that might be a cattle farm that also has horses, like a ranch that also has horses. 39,000 um, census farms reported having horses. And then the number of registered equine farms was 10,000. And I think anecdotally, probably most of us on the call would say that seems a little low for knowing what you know about places like Ontario and Quebec and British Columbia, even where there's quite a concentration of horse farms in the countryside. And we know based on previous studies, um, the various studies from OMAFRA and the Question Canada, but in 1990, I believe, that we know that the equine herd in Canada is undercounted by about a factor four. So we, um, just from various things that have been done in the past, the estimated error is a factor of 3.9, meaning that every horse that was counted by the census would be equivalent to almost four in reality. And that's give or take, another study needs to be done to really fine tune that, but that's what we know based on available um, numbers to date. We also know that horses are part of the agricultural economy. Um, and based on some of their estimates and external data, we know that equine operations purchase approximately nine, between $910 million to $1.3 billion in hay, grain, bedding uh, per year, and also spend approximately $350 million per year on veterinary care. Uh, and equine, equine operations are also part of the agricultural equipment economy, often buying some of those smaller equipment pieces that are um, nice to have. <laughs> and also equine businesses, and this is an important point, have to follow similar regulations to other agricultural businesses of livestock regarding animal welfare, transportation, uh, nutrient management. In Ontario, for example, if you build a new arena or barn, you are gonna be subject to nutrient management regulation, just as a hog or beef operation would be. All right, so the COVID, uh, the survey results from the Question Canada and where we get to in terms of the numbers and trying to estimate the impact on horses in the country is we knew from Census Canada, there are those 10,000 farms that were counted. Uh, we projected that, that was a, there was an error factor there of missing about 50, close to 16,000. So we estimate that there, probably the true number would be closer to 26,000 uh, equine farms across the country. Again, this is probably a conservative estimate, probably still missing a number of the smaller operations, but it at least gives a, a better picture of how many equine facilities there actually are. And three quarters of the survey respondents earned at least one third of their income from lessons, therapy, sport, or other equine activities. So we know that a lot of those farms are actually gathering income from those activities that probably aren't traditionally counted as farm income. 
We also know from the survey that 51% of the survey respondents reported having one month or less of reserve finances and supplies. And this was done in April. So the fact that we're now in mid-June and still having this discussion is concerning. There are probably a lot of businesses and horse people and horses in a considerable amount of stress as we speak. And we also know that 19% of respondents reported being eligible for short-term income assistance. And this is important. There are so many factors here, and <laughs> Christy's been through every detail, I think, so she'll be able to answer questions. But um, part of the way the uh, emergency relief funds were released by the federal government and the way a lot of farm businesses operate as sole proprietors, might not have employees on staff, a lot of those types of income, and, and then the farm business registration number being a barrier for a lot of farms that don't have that. Um, so only 19% were actually eligible at the time of the survey for some of the short-term income assistance uh, programs that were available. And we also knew from the survey that the median number of 5.5 um, horses on farms were active, and we can estimate from the, very, <laughs> the different uh, pieces I've shown before that there were a total number of 145, 695,000 active equines in Canada. Again, this is probably very conservative, but trying to at least get to a point where we can say with confidence that that we know this is probably a pretty close number. And then uh, going from there with the one month of supplies and finances available from the survey respondents, we could calculate that approximately 46,000 horses on 8,455 facilities were facing extreme economic pressure due to the public health uh, regulations to close down um, activities such as lessons camps therapeutic programs, etc. Uh, we also wanted to know what that looked like from a cost perspective. So what does it, so some of the questions that were um, being put towards the industry were, well, so what, if you can get the $2,000 CERB, that's fine. It should be fine for everybody else, but it's not like a hair salon where you put the scissors away and close the door for a while. You still have to feed the horses, take care of them, make sure they're cared for. So. Um, so based on cost estimates from the survey, as well as external sources, uh, we calculate that the median cost per commercially employed equine is $350 per month across the country. And anyone in the horse industry will know that that will vary considerably depending where you live in Canada, uh, with some places being uh, the cost of hay being much more expensive in different parts of the country and things like that. But trying to get a number to, for Question Canada to work with was the key part there. And again, this, uh, this was the really interesting part in terms of where do horses fit. So going back to that definition that breeding and raising that often can be counted as farm income, 55 of the survey respondents were solely relying on that type of income. So they might have been the ones that could qualify for some of the programs. The equine lessons therapy and sport was 153. So more of the survey respondents were in that camp, but the majority were in combination of both. So we know there's a lot of overlap between farms that have some of that horse breeding and raising and then the other economic uses, and that makes sense from knowing the industry. Um, so for some of us, it seems obvious that horses are livestock and should be counted as agricultural and would fall under Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada's uh, jurisdiction. However, they are also used in sport and recreation type of activities. So some people would say that would fall under Heritage Canada's jurisdiction as Heritage Canada is responsible for sports. So, and they were rolling out programs for local sports associations like minor, minor hockey, minor soccer, those types of programs. So wouldn't it fit, make sense to put the horses in there, but they wanna support human uh, athletes, not equine athletes. So they kind of fall in a gray area there as well. <laughs> so, that, so we're kind of in this spot where we're trying to make sure we understand that horses are actually agricultural in nature and it does make sense for Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada to be providing uh, emergency support. And yeah, so this was based on some of those numbers before with this ongoing care, that the total monthly cost of supporting those horses that were in extreme economic, uh, facing extreme economic pressure the total monthly cost of support would be 17.2 million per month uh, in the, during COVID. And then the Question Canada proposed that AAFC would provide relief funding for 75% of that cost per month. So that was um, 
what the kind of goal was there to make that understanding. And just a few thoughts. So that kind of the immediate uh, emphasis on COVID and the response to the COVID-19 situation. But taking all this kind of information and, and uh, data and understanding kind of the challenges of where horses fit in the country and the importance they play in terms of economic and social activities. Uh, we just wanted to give Question Canada a few recommendations. Uh, so, so moving forward that the AFC recognize active equines as an integral part of Canada's agricultural system. And this would be more consistent with countries in Europe, Sweden, for example, uh, they're right the horses are built right into that census of agriculture type of data, but in a much more robust manner. And so looking at that in terms of how can we make sure that the equines are considered as part of this agricultural system across the country. And that Equestrian Canada adopt the definitions of active equines and acti active equine facilities to foster that holistic assessment of the equine sector. So we wouldn't be leaving different types of horse operations out of programs and activities moving forward, but looking at it from the whole industry as a, as a whole. And one thing that I hope to see <laughs> over the years to come is that equine organizations, um, you know, there can be lessons learned from COVID to know that we really need to understand uh, more clearly how much the, the horse herd is in Canada, where, what they're doing, how they're contributing to the economic activities of local communities and provincial activities, as well as um, as important things like disease surveillance and those types of issues as well. And then of course that equine organizations continue to engage in COVID-19 related advocacy for active equines and continue to promote the place of active equines within Canada's agricultural sector. So there's still an emerging need. There's no vaccine yet, so we don't know if things are going to continue. Maybe we have to go back into shutdowns. So being prepared to really keep um, understanding how uh, we can support horses and horse businesses through these times is really important. And that's it for me this morning, Christy. So I'll turn things back over to you. Thank you very much, Bronwyn. And I really appreciate your presentation today. Um, I know we will probably have some questions at the end and I think between the two of us, we can probably conquer most of them. Um, but I, so we'll just let Peter move ahead because he may have some of those answers and then we can, uh, attempt to take everybody off mute and try to uh, do a panel discussion. So next up we have um, Peter Seaman from Grassroot Public Affairs. So Grassroot is, uh, helps businesses and industry associations execute effective communication strategies for government and public relation campaigns. With years of political and private sector experience, the leadership at Grassroots is well positioned to successfully communicate your message with clarity, consistency, and collaboration. And today we have with us Peter, um, who has 20 years experience as a business owner and entrepreneur, and he has been deeply involved in federal and provincial policy, politics since 1993. He's earned an impressive reputation as a campaign manager and highly effective for getting things done. Peter has his MBA in executive management from Royal Roads University, BC, graduating in 2008 with a specialization in leadership. To focus, the focus of grassroots is to bring solid real world business approach to the government advocacy based on clarity, consistency and collaboration. It's designed to help businesses and associations get tangible support for their vision, mission and message. And with that, I will pass it over to you, Peter. Great. Thanks, Christy. I uh, couldn't help but notice on the uh, cover page who that good looking uh, guy was with a head of curly hair. This is my COVID haircut. So uh, <laughs> I am the same person and happy to be here, happy to be participating in this. And I've really learned a lot myself and my team about uh, the equine sector in Canada. I had the opportunity to meet Christy a few years ago with our work with the Canadian Federation of Agriculture and was pleased to jump in and do everything that we can on what is a very critical situation facing all of you and the sector across the country. So what you've just heard from Bronwyn are a lot of the details, the stats, the necessary specific information that you will need when you're speaking to your elected officials. What I'm gonna go through are some tips and tactics on effective ways to advocate to make sure your voice is heard in this challenging time where everybody's just so busy and everything sort of normal has been turned upside down. So let's jump into it and then I'm happy to take questions at the end. So first off, advocacy. Some of you I suspect have been doing this and have done a lot of it and likely have a lot of experience 
and to many of you it might be brand new. So let me just go through the basics of what it is. Advocacy essentially is just the act or process of supporting a cause or proposal or the act or process of advocating in itself. And all of you on this call, I assume, are advocates for the equine sector. So you're ones that plead the cause to, of another or defend or maintain a cause or proposal and support or promote the interest of a cause or group. And at Grassroots, we have a philosophy, hence the name of our company, Grassroots Public Affairs, that there is no better advocate for an industry or a sector than the people who work in that industry every day. We're a consultant. I'd be lying to you if I was said that I was an expert uh, on anything to do with equine. I certainly, as I mentioned a moment ago, know a lot more than I did a few weeks ago. Uh, but your passion, your enthusiasm, your knowledge is what needs to be communicated to as many people as we can in government, governments, uh, both the elected official, their staff, their policy advisors, so that they begin to realize that this is a critical issue and it needs to uh, be supported by them above many others that they're hearing from on a daily basis. So in terms of, even you heard Christy mention it a couple times and we repeat it over and over again, our 3C model of success. Very simple, uh, but to me, it makes a lot of sense. It's worked in other campaigns and it's worth repeating. Clarity, consistency, collaboration. Clarity in the message, know what you wanna say moving forward, consistently delivered across all levels, and then getting as many people as possible to communicate that message to as many people in government as we can. The basic principles of clarity is know what you're asking or wanting to communicate before you begin. I've had the opportunity to accompany many people in uh, meetings face to face with their elected officials and sometimes nervousness gets in the way, sometimes you get sidetracked and start talking about another issue unrelated on your core focus and your core ask and it can water down the message and leave people with some uncertainty in exactly what it is you were there to talk about. In a few slides forward, we'll get to some of the specifics of this message. You already know what it is, but I can't help stress this enough. Do your research ahead of time, know the specifics that you want to talk about with your elected official, and be prepared to focus in on that uh, before you start. Number two, consistency. So remember, you've often heard of the rule of seven in marketing. The idea and the principle that you need to expose someone up to seven times before your pitch, your ask is going to resonate and maybe trigger them to action. I read recently that that number seven may be as high as 14 or 20 nowadays, given how much information is coming at us all with our, through our smartphones and the internet all the time. So it's very important when we're thinking about advocacy of repeating that same ask over and over and over again. I'll tell you a little secret. In conversations I've had with past members of parliament and their staff, as we know and, and you can probably appreciate whether it's a provincial MPP or a federal MP, their offices are inundated with information and asks and, and letters and campaigns each and every day. Uh, many of them are form letters, you know, the same words coming from lots of people. And, and that in itself is a, is a good first step. What's more effective is the custom messages. And when I ask more than one office, what's the number of unique letters around the same topic or unique pieces of correspondence or communication where it starts to resonate and you begin to realize that there's a real issue out there. And surprisingly, most of them said anywhere from six to a dozen six to a dozen different pieces of independently written correspondence or phone calls or conversations in a short period of time from constituents of theirs. And remember, most MPs represent a riding of in and around 100,000 people uh, will suddenly tell them that something's up. It doesn't seem like a big number. It goes to show you that most people don't bother reaching out to their elected officials. And I'll encourage you through this presentation that it's your job to do that. So being consistent and getting as many people possible to say the same message will help that message get through. And that goes to the third point, which is collaboration. And I always like using the analogy of the choir. So whether you've got one person singing a soloist or a choir, the choir will be able to have a louder voice and broadcast that out to a greater number of people and will be heard more readily. The, the, the important thing to remember is that the choir all has to be looking at the same uh, songbook, if you will, and singing the same song. You can't be talking about different things. And I encourage you to think about your networks and your circles. 
I don't know the dynamics of the people on this call today, other than the fact that you're all connected to the equine sector in some way, shape or form. Those of you that run businesses, uh, be sure to communicate and express this issue to your customers, to your other suppliers, your vendors, anyone else that we could potentially get involved to communicate to your local MP or MPP or MLA will help. So more voices we can bring to the table, the better. Christy and her colleagues have been doing an exceptional job at the top level, having those meetings, uh, presenting in front of committees. That's only one level. We now need to activate the broader community across the country. So a reminder, who's our target audience? We've talked about different levels of government and sometimes people mix them up in terms of federal, provincial, or even your municipal level. Our main focus is on federal MPPs and to a lesser degree, depending on where you are, also your provincial MPPs and MLAs. But most of Christie's work and the work done by the executive of Ecoin Canada has been targeted to the federal parliament, the 338 elected members from across the country. Um, little bit of information as well with respects to the makeup and the dynamic of MPs uh, in Ottawa currently representing the uh, population uh, in the 338 ridings. The overwhelming majority of them live and represent urban and suburban ridings. Now I'm not saying that there aren't uh, equine enthusiasts in the cities and in areas, but the percentage of rural ridings is only declining, declining as our country become more urbanized. Why do I tell you that? Well, it matters because compared to 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago, there's probably less people sitting in parliament with direct experience and exposure to rural lifestyles, rural businesses, and even equine facilities. I know that you folks are trying hard to change that and get more people and youth riding horses, but the level of exposure and understanding is at a base point is lower now today with anything to do with agriculture and rural affairs than it was years ago. So we need to be educators when we talk to these folks. If you don't know who your MP or MPP is, uh, from an MP standpoint, very quickly go to Google, you'll find it, put your province in if you're looking provincially, but federally, this link here, Our Commons, takes you right to a site, and you can click on that, put your postal code in, you'll find your member, there'll be contact information there, both of their Ottawa office and their constituency office. Right now, even though Parliament is sitting in a limited capacity, uh, their constituency offices will be open. That's the riding office. If you don't know where it is, depending on how big your riding is, it'll show you. You can call them, you should call them, reach out to them, send an email, send a letter. All the information is there readily available. So let's talk about communicating with your member of parliament specifically. What can you do? And there's lots of things, all of them uh, relevant and valuable, some more than others. So an email is the easiest one. You'll see often when advocacy campaigns are running, they will have a website set up where you can send a form email quickly. It takes only a few moments. It's uh, easy. However, it's also probably the least effective in that it goes to a general staffer's inbox. They'll have anywhere from hundreds to thousands of emails a day and you'll be lucky if they read it. Now, if you know the uh, MP's personal email, that's different. And I encourage you, if you do know that, uh, send them one. Uh, you should be doing that anyway, all, all of your staff members, easy to do, quick, and doesn't take a whole lot of effort. Writing a letter uh, takes a little more effort. Uh, it can be a handwritten letter, it can be a type letter, stick it in an envelope. This is how all offices used to get all their email, all their correspondence and communications from constituents. Now it's rare. And when it's rare, those will get opened and looked at often more quickly than an email. So you can think about that. Call their office. This is what they're there for. Remember, they work for you. Um, and unfortunately, not all offices have the same excellent customer service. Some are better than others. You'll have voicemails, you'll leave messages, but if you can be clear and succinct about your ask and tell them, particularly in your writing, when you're calling your member of parliament that you're a constituent, you have a concern and you wanna to speak to them, usually you'll get a call back and hopefully you'll get an opportunity to set up a call with the member of parliament so you can talk to them. And then that goes to requesting a meeting. I know we're still in this crazy time of COVID-19 and restrictions in terms of getting together, but we are starting to see them open up. And I can tell just by looking at social media that parliamentarians are going out into the community, albeit wearing a mask, and they're willing to have those conversations. So don't be afraid to ask for that. 
the best thing you can do and the most effective thing you can do is invite them out to your farm, uh, invite them to your business, get them to see what it's like, get them to meet some of the people that are dealing firsthand. If you can't do that, have a Zoom meeting like we're doing now and try to talk to them face to face so that they can see and hear directly from you rather than just written correspondence. Tag them in social media. That's what the essence of this campaign is about. We're trying to post pictures, post questions, put them out there on Twitter and Facebook, add their hashtag there. I can tell you a little secret, and while this is probably changing, while members of parliament will typically have one or two levels of the gatekeepers, so to speak, that glean through all their emails and phone calls, many of them are still directly connected to their social media accounts for good or for worse. Some of them get in trouble by doing that. But you can often tag an MP and an MPP and they'll read it directly. So be careful what you write, but want to get their attention. At the very least, you know that staff will be seeing that and, and highlighting that as another request that's coming from your community. Encourage others to do the same. So it's great if you can spend a few minutes doing this. But as I mentioned earlier, maybe you want to send something out if you have a newsletter to your customers or people and say how important this campaign is uh, led by uh, Equestria in Canada and encourage them to do the same thing because the more voices we can have reaching out to uh, elected officials, the better. And then do them all over again. <laughs> uh, send another email, call them again if they're not getting back to you. I know you're all busy. I know you're running businesses and time is limited. Uh, every time we can reach out once or twice, particularly if you are told we'll get back to you or respond and you don't hear a response, send them another message, tell another friend to do the same thing. This is an intense campaign. You guys need support soon and quickly, and we're not going to get it if we stay quiet. I wanted to share this slide with you and it's something we often present in uh, lectures that we do with people and it refers to the types of communication. Really there's three types, verbal, the words that you use and communicate, vocal, the tone, the volume, the pitch, how we communicate those words if we have a chance to speak to someone one-on-one -on -one. and lastly visual. And unfortunately that one is only allowed when we have a chance to do a face-to-face -face interaction, albeit digitally online or in person. And all of these matter in terms of how much they contribute to effective communication and what people remember. And what many people are unaware is of the statistics. Now, when I'm doing a seminar, I usually ask people to guess. It's not practical to do with everybody online here listening to me. I'll give you the numbers. This was done on a couple studies in terms of the effectiveness. So 7% are the words, the specifics. 38% the tone and inflection and 55% uh, the passion, the, the imagery, the uh, conduct that you exude when you're communicating that. So that's why I say if there's any opportunity to get face to face with your MP, that's more effective. Now, this isn't to diminish the words that you use. You need to know those stats as Bronwyn shared with you, particularly if people are asking questions, you can't brush over that. If they ask you those meaningful questions, you need to be able to answer it. But your enthusiasm, your passion, your uh, concern about the welfare of your animals is what's, what's going to get this to come through more than any consultant like me or anyone else can communicate on your behalf. That's why it's critical that we mobilize as big an army as possible to communicate this concern to elected officials. So what's your message? What do you want to spend time communicating when you're talking to these officials in what usually is a pretty limited window of time because their days are busy as Christy mentioned earlier there's lots of stakeholder groups reaching out to them now on every possible industry and sector that you can imagine so what do you need to communicate in the limited time that you have well first of all hopefully you're talking to your member of parliament so that you're a local constituent or you're a business owner uh, whatever those stats may be, tell them how long you've been in business, how many people you employ, uh, the, the type of investment that you've made, whether it's your life savings or at risk. Tell them your story. Only you can tell them that. And MPs usually want to hear directly from their constituents and know when they're facing challenges. You're part of a long-standing economically significant sector. Cite the stats. I was blown away uh, at the diversity of the sector until I, I learned about it through Christy and her colleagues. Uh, that's important. Bronwyn gave lots of great examples of the diversity of this. People don't think of that, particularly if they have little or no exposure. They might go right away to equestrian in the Olympics and horse racing and not think of all the other long-standing businesses that are part, whether that's your business or others. 
Maybe you want to talk about some of the different types of businesses in the riding or in the region and the businesses that feed into that, whether they're feed companies or veterinarians, et cetera. All of them are at risk based on what's going on. That the industry is in trouble and desperate need of emergency funding. And this is where I think you can have a perfect opportunity to go into what really is a relatively modest and conservative ask by the industry, as was outlined in Bronwyn's presentation. Given the billions of dollars that have been thrown around, it doesn't strike me as a huge uh, number. Now, what's in it for them? Well, uh, what's at risk is not only animal welfare, but businesses closing up for good. Businesses that could potentially be employing people and part of the local economic base particularly in rural Canada, where that's already under pressure for a variety of other reasons. So it's important to talk about this and to say this is desperate. And the good work that's been done by the industry to clarify that the funding would be available principally to those businesses most in need. This isn't just free money to everybody. This is to target it to the ones that need it most uh, to make a difference and to keep them going. Now, I know this is a sensitive issue, uh, the, the, the possibility of animals having to be euthanized. Uh, those sorts of messages, and maybe they're stark, and maybe they're kept towards the end, if you're comfortable talking about it, are the truth. And they need to hear this. So the businesses will close forever and won't be able to open up if they don't, can't keep their animals going. This is the truth and reality. And there were some examples of something similar for those of you in Ontario years ago on the horse racing issue and the previous government was looking at cutting funding. I didn't work on that file, but I was told that it was the threat and the suggestion that we could be facing lots of animals being culled and, and people going out of business and the human toll on that that actually motivated that government to try and find other sources of revenue at the time to keep some of that industry going. So um, that's the powerful uh, story that can be and potentially can move people. I know it's sensitive, you gotta see if you wanna talk about that, but that's the truth, right? And that's what we're worried about. So let's not be afraid to talk about it. And lastly, ask them, will you help? Uh, can we count on your support? What more do you need from us in terms of pushing this forward to your counterparts? If you're dealing with a government MP, they're going to defer to the agriculture minister or the minister of tourism and sport. Ask them to go to the finance minister. What else do they need from you? You have all the backup information and specifics if it's needed. So you'll get that to them, but ask them at the end. Don't just make the pitch and then leave. Ask them specifically, will they be prepared to help and what can they do? Okay, so tips for advocacy in person. When you have those opportunities to meet and have conversations with officials in person on, on the computer like we're doing today, or even better, uh, at their office or at your business or in the community. Personalize your story, as I said before. Uh, you may be a director, you may be someone that speaks on behalf of lots of people, that's okay. Personalize, talk about the relationships that you know, whether your business is one of the ones are struggling or the ones that you know of. Keep it local if you can. It's best if it's in the riding or if it's in the general region, that's okay too. Do some research on your MP. I mentioned earlier that many of them are um, not that familiar or didn't have a big background in agriculture. Obviously, the rural ridings will have, uh, but to some degree, you get a lot of younger members now there who have you know, only in their 30s, maybe not a whole lot of experience, find out. Maybe you find someone that has direct connection to the sector and you can leverage that to build your bond. So if you don't already know your MP, go to their website, check out their bio, do a little research, it doesn't take long. It arms you with some information that may be valuable in your conversation with them. Ask the questions. I'm doing a lot of talking now because of the format that we're doing, but normally in a good engagement with your elected officials, it shouldn't just be one way, right? You should be asking them some questions about what they know, if they've heard of this, um, what are the other challenges they're facing. We know that the focus is on delivering them the ask, but it can't just be a 30-minute one-way conversation. As my next point, conversations over lectures. Have it two-way, ask them if they can help. Uh, make sure that you're having a dialogue there and certainly listening for anything that maybe opposition roadblocks, uncertainties, questions that they may have, you can make a note of and follow up on. And ask them what else you need to do. We've, Christy and I have gone to meetings and sometimes they've asked for specific information and different things that we need to follow up with them on. You can't possibly tell them everything in a short window, that, that, especially that introductory meeting that you may be uh, sharing with them the concerns on this. 
but um, there may be other things that you need to come back with. So ask them what else you need to do, particularly at the end of a meeting or a conversation. Make sure you follow up when asked. Nothing worse than an MP's office saying, okay, can you get me this? And you say, yes, we'll do that. And then you get back to your business and you're busy and you forget. Uh, if there's two people to go in the meeting, have one person make some notes, or if there's two people on a call, make some notes, make sure nothing's forgotten, make sure that you follow up on your commitments with them. If you can, if you're with them, take pics, ask them if you're on an online meeting, can, can I take a screenshot and post this? Do you mind if I uh, send a tweet out saying that we had this conversation? Usually and overwhelmingly the response will be positive and they'll be willing to do that. That way you put it to some degree on public record that you've had this conversation, that you've had a meeting, you've welcomed and appreciate the opportunity that they've taken time out of their schedule to meet with you. And uh, you're kind of holding them accountable in a public forum by doing that. So pictures are more powerful than anything else if you can get them, even pictures with them at your business wearing a mask, uh, but even just tweeting or posting about it is gonna be effective. So I took a quick look before the call just to see what was on there. I know this campaign's just started, but a couple of good examples. So uh, Alex here on the left he sent a tweet out and tagged the Provincial Minister of Agriculture, Ernie Hardiman, using the hashtag Save Canada's Horses. I love the picture of the horse in that we need to share pictures that demonstrate the seriousness of this. It's a fine line. Uh, we don't want to see happy smiling groups of people around very happy looking horses. I know a horse always looks happy, but you get my point. You want some seriousness to this and ensure that people know that there's a lot at stake. This one here uh, tweeted out their MP, Peter Schiffke, and talked and also added the question Canada handle and the hashtag as well. And then the third one to the right side shows the post from Equestrian Canada. This has just started. There's a few on here. I'm hoping with your support and engagement, both on Twitter, Facebook, and on Instagram, those being the three most popular, we can get as much content on as possible so that all the members of parliament, whether they're in the government or opposition, can continue to see that this issue is significant, that it's important and it's not going away and it needs them to step up and address it. So that's my presentation, Christy. I'm happy to take any questions. I hope I provided some insights, some ideas, and uh, I turn it back to you. Perfect, thank you very much, Peter. And I will say that I uh, posted on Facebook and Instagram and Twitter, and actually my MPP um, had acknowledged my post with a like and a comment on Facebook. So uh, it is an effective means. So what I think I'm gonna do is, you should have the ability to raise your hand if you have a question. There should be a function on your taskbar to do that. If you're not able to locate that part, just write me a question or a chat and I will um, unmute your line so that you can ask either Peter, myself, or Bronwyn a question. So we will just, um, I'll look for raised hands and I see Jill. So I'll, I'm just gonna let you, where'd you go, Jill? Oh, I think you dropped off the call. I see him down the list, Christy. You do? Yeah. Are you able to uh, unmute, Peter? Uh, no, I can just chat with him, sorry. I'll unmute Danny Gaunt for first. Okay, you should be good to go, Danielle. Hi, Christy, and hi, Peter and Bronwyn. Um, I had a quick question. So how do we present a unified front uh, when some of the other provinces are not as concerned with the welfare uh, and the state of COVID-19. So I've heard from some of the other provinces uh, that the, I guess, criticalness of the state of emergency isn't as crucial to them uh, and they're not having as many problems. So how do we get the uh, federal government to pay attention when all the provinces aren't uh, showing the same sense of urgency? Thanks, I will, um, I'll take that question. So I think um, you raised some good points and I think we've also been working with the national affiliates because they also do have their provincial counterparts. I think as we know across the country, the impacts have been different based on the type of business or the region or what the provincial and regional um, 
legislations and requirements are at this point. So in all the conversations with both the federal and provincial governments, I have um, been communicating to them that there really is a dynamic of a specific type of business that's being impacted. And we shared that information with them in terms of how to assess that. So, I mean, it's very important. And I think that was part of my opening statement. It's very important that everyone in the industry, even if you're not being directly impacted, one of your fellow industry members is, and it may be COVID-19 that impacts us now, but it could be a different issue that impacts a different group of us later. And we are, it is important for us to be united and to support each other in that. So um, we know there's diversity across the sector. And I think it's important for the individual business owners, whichever province they're in, or who, anybody who wants to get involved to use your voice to say that there is an issue and that you are supportive of the campaign. Awesome, thank you. Uh, so Gilles, I found you and I'm going to unmute you. So you should be able to ask a question now. You just have to unmute yourself. Now, okay. Okay, there you go. Hello, have there people in radio land? <laughs> Hi Gilles. Please introduce uh, who you represent as well. Okay, I'm the president of the Canadian Quarter Horse Association, which is a pan-Canadian association representing all of the affiliates that tie in with quarter horse activities, competing events, as well as pleasure or, or recreational type of activities, which is quite significant. It's uh, personally speaking, it's probably the largest uh, breed in terms of a horse breed in Canada at this present time. And I must applaud both of your presentations, or the, your, the three of you. <laughs> and I listened into uh, Christy when she met with the, uh, she ran the gauntlet, you might say, in front of the Parliamentary Commission last week. And she's to be applauded for that because it does, there's two levels there. But I must say one thing, I had voiced this, and I keep voicing this, we have to hold our public representatives politicians, even though I applaud what the people have done throughout history with politicians, was be line them up against the wall and shoot them, but that's another story. <laughs> but we must hold them accountable. I mean, the debate and the discussions around this have been going on. I relate back to 1995, for instance, when Ontario did an economic study of the impact of the horse industry in Ontario. And it demonstrated clearly in numbers, it represented over $5 billion, billion worth of impact for the province. So we have to hold our parliamentary people uh, accountable, both of the federal as well as the provincial. And, and then in very specific terms, you know, people raise campaigns and there has to be a consequence for their inactivity or their uh, lack of response. I'm not talking blackmail, I'm not talking, but I'm talking putting the truth on the table with them. We as an industry, I had last night a conference call with the Quebec Quarter Horse Association and they're challenged. They're challenged by their provincial authorities. They're challenged by the economics. People are losing jobs. People are completely going out of business, et cetera, et cetera. And they keep hearing all this rhetoric and we're not, seeing any real tangible results on the part of the government. So I don't know how, I know it's sometimes it's a long process and so on, but I'd like to hear all three of you and Bronwyn and Peter about, uh, you know, your experience and this type of thing. I mean, it, this is a long battle for a long haul and, you know, it, it could be many years before we see any kind of results. I don't know. I hope it's soon. So Christy, if I could comment on that. It's an excellent point, and all of you, as I mentioned earlier, have connections directly to your business and indirectly. Some of you will have been in your community for decades in the business that you're running now. Some of you are brand new. And not to be communicated as a threat, uh, go to them as your elected official. Some of you may have strong relationships, good relationships with those members, and some of you may not know who they are. Communicate to them the number of people that Lives will be changed if businesses, whether they're yours or others like yours in the area, will be forced out of business because of COVID-19. And that uh, just like any other issue coming up, 
that people look to their elected officials. This is a relatively modest ask. You guys are caught in between some definitions currently in government between agriculture and tourism and sport. And as a result, you've got businesses that can't qualify for emergency funding. Uh, this is also an integral part of rural economic development. The country is continually looking at challenges to keep rural economies going, agriculture being the big anchor of it, but you're part of it and the consequences will be too significant and that you'll you know you don't want to threaten them as was mentioned but you want to certainly tell them that you'll be sharing these conversations the meetings and any information that the member of parliament will bring back to them to the number of people that you talk to on a daily day-to-day -day -day basis with respect to your business so that is a good thing to do thank and, you and jill certainly from the federal um aspect in the conversations we have both the ourselves and canadian federation of agriculture putting a significant amount of pressure on a number of ministers um, and cfa who is their main sole reason of being is advocacy they're as equally as frustrated as we are with the response to the equine sector um, and and especially giving the level of detail that we have provided and like peter mentioned the modesty of the ask and the reality of the impact so um, we are continuing to work on that strategy to see something tangible but this is part of the need for launching a public campaign and getting everybody involved and getting the message out there um, I don't know, Bronwyn, if there's anything you wanted to add, but I have another question. I had David Ryan had put up his hand, so I'm just going to take you off mute and allow you to ask your question. Unless, Jill, do you have anything to follow up? No, I just want to thank you. Thanks, Jill. Okay, so David, uh, you're going to have to unmute yourself, but then you should be okay to ask your question, and then I will go to the questions in the chat. Okay, thanks very much. Um, in regards to the advocacy, um, it's great to say we need support, um, but it's good to, especially dealing, when you're dealing with, I mean, you were dealing with the politicians, it goes back to the bureaucrats anyway. Um, it'd be good to have some, some overall numbers. Like, it's good to say our revenues have declined, but if there's a potential to develop an average to say on average, you know, across Canada, they've declined by, you know, 80%, 90%, so that uh, when people are actually talking to those politicians, bureaucrats, and you can say, here's where it is. Um, and then another point being is perhaps you, go, you could think about developing and sending out a list of potential objections um, <clears throat> that will come back to each person and have responses for them. Because I know, you know, those that do qualify for the wage subsidy, um, that, that's the first, I've, I've already had it. That's the first thing that's come back from a member of parliament. Well, you, you got a 75% wage subsidy. What else do you need? You know, that's great. But when you look at your revenue decline of 90% and, uh, you know, if you haven't got any money, you can't pay a wage anyway. So, uh, you know, if there's a possibility of developing objections and responses to those objections, <clears throat> it might be a good idea. Um, the other thing, we, we're a therapeutic riding association. So we deal with, uh, youth and children with uh, disabilities. Um, we want to support this. Um, <laughs> the, I watched the video that had come out in the, uh, in the email and there's, there's no way in the world that I could put out through our social media the, the word that horses are being euthanized because it could be devastating to some of our followers, uh, the children. So just wondering as well if there's a, a secondary messaging or something that could be developed that uh, people like ourselves in the therapeutic world could uh, could push out because uh, we, we just don't want to cause any unneeded concerns but uh, I think it's a great initiative and we do want to support as best we can so and I'm going to have to leave you shortly because I do have to look after a horse so uh, um, I just want to thank you all for the time you put into this and uh, I'll, I'll just sort of listen to the responses and then I'll be on my way. Thanks, David. So I will, um, I've definitely received every potential objection that could come from this. So that's something that's easily uh, put together. And um, ongoing, uh, any feedback you have on why programs are not working for you helps to add to that list of objections. So that's something that I can totally um, help facilitate for you. Um, we under, I think Peter mentioned, we were aware of the sensitivity around um, around the issues of euthanasia and, and more within our community than actually in the public. Um, but it is a reality and that's been expressed to us by 
um, community members that they want to know that government knows that this is what's happening. So it's kind of finding that catch 22 balance between the two things. But I think we can incorporate your feedback into more communications or give you something that you can use that's a little more um, tuned to your to your network. Cause we do know there's um, a large network like yours that is looking for support as well. I don't know, Peter, is there anything you wanted to add to that? To me as an outsider listening in David to your comments, you don't want to talk about the horses. I get that. You talk about the number of people that have been benefiting so greatly from those therapy services that are going to be now without a business because of what you're currently facing. That is almost more impactful and get some of them to offer up testimonials or have them reach out about their concerns about their family member not being able to go to that service that has proven to be so helpful and beneficial to them. So some extra things to think about. Okay, so in the chat, we have a question from um, May. Is it possible to incorporate inter interprovincial law that active equine facilities be designated as essential businesses to protect the health of commercially employed employees? If so, what will it take? Um, so I think that's a, a very good question that requires a lot of investigation into it. Um, for the most part, the stables were all required as essential businesses. The problem is we're in a, a pandemic to which public facing programs were canceled. And we know that the, the value of those public facing programs is that a good portion of the uh, income that they receive and the revenue that they generate comes through those programs. So what we're hoping to do by addressing the farm registration issues and not being able to access the agriculture specific programs is to be able to make sure that if something like COVID-19 or something that stops the public to come to your farm to help you generate revenue, that you would be considered in business risk management programs that would help support you during that lapse in revenue. So we see it in other agricultural sectors and other products where something out of the farmer's control has, um, has diminished their revenue or uh, given them um, additional expenses. And it's a sort of stability program that helps you to maintain and ride that tide until you're back into a platform of revenue, revenue generation. So I think for the long term, it's looking at making sure we're classified appropriately, like you mentioned, but also making sure that we have the accesses to the resources that we need to ride any type of um, storm that impacts our business. And that can include a variety of things like natural disasters and, and market disruptions. So, uh, Bronwyn, anything you wanted to add on that side? No, I think you captured everything. It was just kind of interesting with that last question from David, the essential business aspect of therapeutic riding is, would be something really interesting to explore because that is a more getting into the health and well-being of humans in relation to the jobs that those horses are doing. So that'd be really, uh, I think, an interesting avenue to look into a little bit further. Absolutely. And Nancy, if we receive funding, how it will be, how will it be distributed? So we would, we have um, originally had asked that it be included as a business risk management program delivered by Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada. But at this point, we're working with uh, multiple different agencies to see what pre-existing program structure uh, we can tap into that's going to be more responsive than an, an existing AAFC program. So it would be a similar applicant process as you would do through the Canadian Emergency Relief Benefit, but it would be distributed through the government as a relief program is what we've uh, proposed to them. So I'm just wondering if we have any other questions. Uh, I don't see any hands up. Oh, we have Doug Orr. Doug, you'll just have to unmute yourself and then you should be okay. There Thanks, you go. Christy. No Thanks, Bronwyn and, and Peter. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm, I'm Doug Orr. I sit on the board of directors at EC, and uh, I, I do have a question, but I really want to uh, uh, express my thanks to this group for the work you've done on this. It's uh, really, really powerful, really encouraging, and I know uh, the Equine Industry Development Council is, uh, committee as well of EC is uh, uh, really appreciative of this work. Uh, my my question is is to Christy, but uh, Bronwyn and Peter may may have some uh, in, information on this as well. I know Christy that the uh, the equine definition crossed our board and and at, at its primary basic level certainly was moved forward. And you were engaged in some conversations. And I'm just wondering for this group, do we have any feedback yet from 
uh, government agencies, I'm thinking particularly CFIA and AAFC, on their response to uh, our, our better definition of what an active equine is? Yeah, I think, so CFIA, they haven't had much exposure to it because they go off of regulations such as the health of animals regulation. So their agency wouldn't be really impacted by the definition because for the most part, for all the acts or regulations that they administer, they have their own set definitions. Um, from AAFC, the response has been that it's been very clarifying. So we've also had the opportunity when the AAFC working group was up, we had shared um, the definition with them in terms of this is what we would like to see pushed forward to the CRA to, to replace the existing definitions and the existing interpretations as um, being the proper way to assess the sector and to be able to understand the difference between primary equine agriculture and secondary. And the response has had no pushback, which is, I think, a huge win. Um, everybody thinks it makes complete sense at this point in time. Uh, one of the questions that I received when I was presenting to the Ag Committee was directly about what movement have we seen from CRA in terms of adopting the definition and I think unless Peter knows something I don't yet we haven't had a response from the Minister of Finance at this point in time but we've had a lot of support both from the Minister of Agriculture's office as well as some other uh, MP stakeholders to really support Equestrian Canada to working towards having the CRA support that definition. So Bronwyn I don't know if you've heard anything else or anything else to add to that but um, that is in the last meeting I had with the minister's office, um, we had short-term goals, which was identifying programs where the relief funds could be administered more quickly than through the AAFC programs. The long-term goals were to work on having that def definition adapted throughout CFA and AAFC. So um, there was no pushback or no need to change, um, but there was a, a, there's nothing tangible that has come out of it yet, but I think <laughs> that's the case for everything. So, and even from external stakeholders like the Canadian Federation of Agriculture, who's been working on this issue for decades, felt that the definition and the way that both Bronwyn and I were able to clarify has really brought a lot of clarity to them of where the issues um, sit within the sector and that's better helped them to advocate on our behalf as well. Awesome, thank you. No problem, and then I see, um, Danny, you have your hand up again. So if you just want to unmute yourself, you're good to go. Awesome. So, uh, sorry, I didn't introduce myself before. So I'm Danny Glantz. I uh, work for OFA as a policy analyst and also sit on the board of directors for Ontario Equestrian. So I just wanted to kind of build a little bit on um, just the last response. So um, I know that I brought the definition of active equine uh, before the board of directors at OFA and we adopted uh, that we we approved that we would uh, approve that definition and they are accepted as agriculture in our mind. Um, have any other agricultural organizations had the same response or have you approached any other uh, organizations because uh, like any farming organizations because I know we all build into CFA yeah. and obviously while we do it provincially um, the more uptake we have the better. So have any other farming organizations looked at or been approached to, to adopt uh, the definition of active equines? So I think that's something that we would need to follow up with some of our provincial organizations on, as well as CFA had a resolution on the books um, to help assist Equestrian Canada with the um, with developing, so at, at the time it was the commercial farming definition, but after working with Bronwyn and moving ahead, and as Doug mentioned, went forward to our board of directors, we now have um, a definition that Equestrian Canada is going to bring to the CFA table for them to help us with that advocacy effort as well. So they, we had a resolution on the table for CFA. And I think you know, Danny, that all of the uh, general farm organizations are also members at CFA. So that will be the platform to start bringing it to their attention. And I think it'll be very great that OFA will be there <laughs> supporting and saying that they've already taken it on. Awesome, great. I just wanted to, to check that in. Thank you guys. And thanks for all the work you guys have been doing. It's been awesome. Thank you and thank you for all your messaging on social media and within OFA. I think <laughs> OFA has been a big supporter of, um, of the campaign and of the equine industry and that does bring a lot of weight to it that you are such a recognized farming association. Happy to help. <clears throat> 
So I don't know if I see any more questions. There might be, okay. Nancy Olson asked specifically for emergency funds to the provinces, how will EC distribute the funds? So the intention is that EC will not be responsible for distributing the funds. The ask is that we're asking them to come up with a federally delivered, federally established and most likely as most things work provincially delivered emergency funds specific to the equine sector. So we've asked them for a variety of things. Um, we don't care how the resolution comes, we are looking for a resolution. So whether they change eligibility that helps us to access pre-existing AAFC programs, or they work within the parameters of pre-existing programs to help um, address the financial gaps that the sector is seeing. But the expectation is that the government will uh, be delivering the funds through whichever means they think is most applicable. Okay, I don't see any more hands at this time. I'll just give everybody else another minute if they want to ask a question or pop it into the chat. Christy, if I could, while you're waiting for that, just make a yep. comment on the question earlier about communications with the Minister of Finance and others. And this is a great example and an opportunity, despite the critical nature facing the industry and a lot of the businesses. And I know that. Uh, your members are being encouraged to reach out to push for this specific ask but what you're doing is building dialogue and you're also educating and informing elected officials about your sector all too often industries only do that like we're doing now i'm not saying you haven't done it before christy i know that's largely your job but getting more voices across the country to have those conversations with their elected officials talking about the reality and the economic impacts of the sector is only going to help when something else comes down the road they're going to have a better understanding than they would have a few years ago and also just a reminder to everyone that every time there's an election there's a turnover of MPs in in Ottawa maybe as high as 30 40 percent or higher so you're getting fresh faces in there you may have had a great relationship and many meetings and engagements with your last MP who retired or didn't run last time or got beaten uh, so keep that in mind we have to unfortunately we have to keep re-educating and building those relationships that's what government relations is all about having that relationship and rapport with them so that when you do need them they're going to know who you are and what you represent so all of this while there's a short-term focus in this campaign there's also a long-term benefit that everyone can help contribute to yeah that's a great point peter and i think we already are seeing the long-term benefits in terms of Although we haven't seen anything tangible out of the minister's office, the responsiveness from when we first started in March to date is a lot better. You know, we are we're speaking weekly. We're getting um, we're getting um, responses to our emails in a timely fashion. We have m different numbers of. Um, staff involved and we have lots of engagement we've talked to everybody in the programs branch so I think long term and you know the ongoing feedback that we get is that they've heard about the issue and that they know that which means they know that the sector is loud so a prime example is we had a senator share something about the equine sector and it got over 325 shares and if you go through his historical page he only gets about a max of 10. So they start to know that they don't want equine making noise because we're all very passionate and we're all very loud. Okay, so I think we will try to end it there for today. If there are any other questions, please feel free to email me, khouse at equestrian.ca. Um, additionally, we have the website is very well stocked with resources. So if you go industry and go to about industry, um, under here we have two tabs. One is COVID-19 response. This is where you can find the latest social media campaign as well as Bronwyn's report, how to locate your MPP, uh, a preloaded template for writing your MPP and some steps, as well as the different fundraisers that exist and, and a variety of resources. We also have in there a summary of the key advocacy messages and what's been done in terms of engagement to date. And then under COVID-19 resources, we have uh, lots of quick links. So different um, headings that get into more detail, including the operations guidelines and a few other things. So very, there's a ton of information on the website. It's just a matter of locating what you're looking for. And if there's something specific you're looking for, please just email me anytime, as well as I've spent a lot of time with different business owners, helping them prep for meetings with their MPs. I'm happy to do that or speak to any of your provincial or regional associations and help get people engaged in, and educated. So. Um, I'd like to thank both Peter and Bronwyn for your help 
to date as well as your presentations today. And thank you to everybody else who joined the call. We will have the recording up and available as soon as possible. And it will be um, also included in the weekly wrap up that usually goes out on Fridays. So Christy, I'm just gonna jump in and say that I will tweet my MP this afternoon and tell them about Save Canada's Horses hashtag. I encourage you all to do the same. I have a sister-in-law who's a rider. I don't know how much or where she is of this. So I'm gonna send her a note. So all of us, I challenge you to post something today. Let's get started on this and keep the ball rolling. Thank you. Okay. Have a great day. Bye guys. Thank you. Bye. Bye. -bye.